Good afternoon. Good after. Is this thing? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't really need this because I can usually talk pretty loud, but I think this is working. Welcome to uh, Hacker House, um, the House of Formation, House of Residence for the Paulist Fathers for men uh, studying for the priesthood. Also, Paulist Evangelization Ministries is headquartered here. Our new home. Um, we've been here for just a little bit over a year. And you're all very, very welcome. Um, and we're especially pleased to welcome Sister Janine and National Catholic Reporter for honoring her for her lifelong work, which I hope will continue for many more years. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I don't usually need a mic because I'm from the Bronx, but <laughs> I'll use it anyway. Hi, I'm Joe Ferrillo, the publisher of the National Catholic Reporter. And just before we get going to make sure, I don't know if there are any tourists or tour groups in the room, but this is not the JP2 Center. This is not the, <laughs> if, if you're lost, it's easy. You just, you make a right, then you make another right and another right. And when you think you've gone way too far to the right, you're there. So I'll give anyone a moment who needs to leave. No, okay, thank you. Um, and thank you to Sister Janine for being here. Uh, Father Paul, D Peter Daly is here. Uh, Peter has a wonderful essay in NCR on Monday or Tuesday, I forget. Read them both days, why don't you? Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, for us at NCR, 2023 was a remarkable year where people on the margins began to get heard. People who had advocated for the voiceless, not only found their voice, but found their voice listened to. And as we were trying to think of who a newsmaker of the year would be, we focused on that. NCR was uh, established in 1964, 60 years ago, uh, in, a, in a moment with Vatican II that, oh, now it's louder. Thank you. Okay. Wow. It's like I'm back at Yankee Stadium. Um, at a moment when, of remarkable change, where many of the initiatives of Vatican II began to come to the U.S., and in Kansas City, a group of journalists said, well, well, wait, it looks like lay people, those on the margins, are being welcomed more into the church now. We as lay Catholics should open a newspaper that's not run by the church, that's not overseen by any religious order, that's just run by lay Catholics, dealing with issues that matter to us. And they always focused on social justice issues and the people who have been disregarded and dismissed. And that effort, as you well know, has had its ups and downs over the last 60 years. But last year, it began to break through. We talked more about women in the church. There are 80 women who participated in the synod. They didn't just sit there quietly. They weren't told to shut up. They spoke, they were listened to, and they voted. And it was a remarkable thing for us. In the midst of that remarkable year, though, one person stood out. And it was Sister Janine, who, as many of you know, has led a long and lonely battle for people on the margins, for the LGBTQ community. Uh, Tom Roberts, who is here, a longtime writer and editor and a dear friend, said he remembers covering Sister Janine in those early years where there were more people outside protesting her than who came inside to listen to her. So she wasn't being heard. She was being shouted over. And last year, in a strong way, that stopped. A pope said, sit down, I want to listen to what you have to say. You are heard. And it was a remarkable thing. Where it goes from here, we don't know. It's the Catholic Church, it moves in mysterious ways. Perhaps 2,000 years from now, we will find out what it, what it all means. But it's a remarkable step forward. And for those of us who've lived through the last 60 years, we'll take one. We'll take it. Um, and so we were thrilled to have her be our newsmaker of the year. Let me introduce to you now um, Josh McElwee. Josh is, runs our Washington Bureau. Don't be impressed, it's just him and one other person. But <laughs> uh, that's we're a small nonprofit people. Um, and, uh, and has known and reported on Sister Janine for many years. He was our Vatican correspondent for seven years, the first seven years of the Francis Papacy. Um, and also was the man who wrote our editorial. 
uh, about our newsmaker of the year and about Sister Janine. So let me have Josh come up. Josh Mackle. Well, thank you all for being here. This is like an overflow crowd at Yankee Stadium, so this is lovely. <laughs> Um, as you know, National Catholic Reporter is a serious and important newspaper. As ambassadors for the vocation of journalism and the importance of independent reporting on the Catholic Church, our staff always conducts itself with professionalism, honor, and dignity, especially dignity, except for about once a year when we host a knockdown, drag them out brawl among the editors and staff. If you can, picture a 1960s episode of Star Trek. Something has happened to the crew, some unknown alien anomaly. They've entered hand-to-hand -hand combat. Dramatic music is blurring. And despite barely being touched, Captain Kirk has ripped his shirt wide open. <laughs> this is the Zoom call where we editors and staff discuss who should be named the Catholic Newsmaker of the Year. Tensions run hot. People come with very fixed opinions of who had the most impact on the year coming to an end. Compromise, that's impossible. <laughs> After 45 minutes or so, our publisher, hi Joe, he says, well, let's shut it down. 60 years of putting out the paper, that's enough. It's a good day to call it quits. I exaggerate a little bit. <laughs> that's what it's usually like. But this year, as the NCR editors and staff met to discuss who to name as the Catholic newsmaker of 2023, there really wasn't a lot of debate. I think it was Joe who maybe five minutes into the Zoom call said something like, what about Janine? It was beyond obvious. For those of us used to an institution that thinks in millennia, 2023 was an incredible year. There was extraordinary, if tentative, movement on how the Catholic Church includes and ministers to its LGBTQ members. Pope Francis condemned the continuing cr criminalization of homosexuality in some African countries. He signed off on a note from the Vatican's powerful doctrinal office, clarifying that trans persons can't be baptized, and he expressed openness to Catholic blessings for same-sex couples. Just about six weeks ago, Francis went even further on that last bit. He had the doctrinal office promulgate a decree, making it clear that priests can bless same-sex couples. As the NCR editors met last December to discuss the big news items of the year, it seemed that this movement for the church to better include its LGBTQ members was the clearest big thing for 2023. But we also knew that it wasn't only or even really about the Pope. It was about the countless number of LGBTQ persons and advocates who have been pushing and pleading and praying for the church to live up to its teachings on the inherent dignity of all human beings. There are many in this room who have been among those pushing and pleading many more who aren't here who we could name. I won't name them because I will leave someone who is deserving out. But we turn to Janine. All of us are here because she invited us. We know her. She's a minister, a friend, and the person who does the dishes at the New Ways house. <laughs> As we said in our editorial, over the past five decades of American Catholic experience, Perhaps no single person has had the kind of impact for our LGBTQ community members as Loretto's sister, Janine Gramic. All of us here know the outlines of the story. Decades of dogged and persistent and caring work. The prophetic founding of New Ways Ministry in 1977 with Father Robert Nugent. The ill treatment by Vatican officials. The airplane run-in with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Being forced to leave one religious order only to join another and just keep at it. And among those who now knows this story is Pope Francis himself, Janine's pen pal. <laughs> this October, the two of them met in person for some 50 minutes, along with Janine's New Ways colleagues, several of whom are here, at the Vatican's Casa Santa Marta, where Francis lives. In an interview the next day with me and my colleague, Christopher White, for our podcast, The Vatican Briefing, feel free to subscribe. <laughs> Janine mentioned how the Vatican had set up the chairs for the meeting too far apart for her liking. So perhaps with a little bit of gall and definitely with a lot of cunning, she just went ahead and slid her chair a little closer to the Pope's. As we said in our editorial, 
We cannot say exactly what made Francis more open and aware this year to the needs of LGBTQ Catholics. But certainly that sister scooching her chair forward has had an outsized impact. For 50 years of successful advocacy, ministry, and influence, Loretto's sister Janine Gramick is NCR's newsmaker of 2023. Congratulations, Janine. Thank you for being with us. And Joe, maybe if you want to come up, we're going to give Janine an official item here, marking her as newsmaker of the year. Well, I want to thank you both Joe and Josh and all of you here, all of everyone at NCR, of course, and all of you here and so many more who are not here because this award from NCR is in recognition of the value of LGBT people and of course my role in bringing about that awareness, but the award really is for all of you here and for many who are not here because you have all contributed to this awareness over the years in one way or another or you wouldn't be here. So you, 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 you are the real newsmakers of the year. And when I was thinking about what I was going to share with you today, because Josh said you could say a few words, I said, hmm, I, <laughs> <laughs> I really uh, didn't want to say a few words. So I'll say a few words, but then I want to open it up for questions and answers, because I always feel, you know, people don't want to sit and listen, you know, for minutes and minutes and minutes. You know, people want to say something. So get your questions ready. <laughs> But uh, as I was thinking about this <clears throat> award, Newsmaker of the Year, I um, said to myself, well, newsmaker. You know, I think we're all newsmakers. And then you're, you're going to ask me, well, how are, how are you a newsmaker? So, of course, I went to the dictionary to look up newsmaker. And it says, a newsmaker is a person prominent in the news. <laughs> now, now, you know, that's not a good definition to have part of it, you know, as an explanation. News. But what news? You know, you could say, well, there's world news, there's national news, there's city news. But, you know, there's other kinds of news. You know, there are other spheres of influence besides the world, the nation, the city. You know, think about your neighborhood, like Dolly Pomerleau. She's a newsmaker in her neighborhood. I know that. Okay. So we have different spheres, different places. I mean, um, think of your job, or if you're still employed, <laughs> <laughs> or when you were employed. And in, in um, interaction with people in your job, there's news that goes on, and you're part of making that news, and other people are making that news. So there's job news. And certainly there's family news but don't talk politics, okay. But there's family news. What's, what's the news in the family? You know, what's happening? What has happened last month or in the last couple of weeks? What's the news? Is everybody okay? You know, uh, there's family news. And then there's a word we use at New Ways, which I love, it, that's like news, but we say gossip. You know, what's the gossip? <laughs> but gossip is good. I mean, it's, it's, it, it brings you up to date. What's the news? So. We are all newsmakers. We listen to news and we make news. We are newsmakers. But the other part of the definition, it said, um, it said and the newsmaker is a prominent person in the news. Well, you can say, okay, I'm in the news, but I don't think I'm prominent. But you are prominent. Each of us is prominent because 
prominent, you're prominent or you're important. And you would say, why? Well, if you believe what Pope Francis teaches, and I'm sure you do, <laughs> Pope Francis says, each of us is important because we are loved by God. That makes us important. Love makes us important. And so, I at times have not felt important, and probably at times you have not felt important. But at those times, God has been into my life, mostly through people, and has like pricked my, my soul, my mind, to remind me that I am important. So this afternoon, I would like to share with you about three people in my life who have reminded me how important I am. Or they have um, picked me up, you know, when I have been down. So the, the first person I would like to tell you about, actually, I never met her. Uh, she founded the School Sisters of Notre Dame that I was a part of for 40 years. Her name, I always like to say, you know, Mother Teresa, and everybody thinks of Mother Teresa in India, but uh, she was from Germany, and her name was Mother Teresa Gerhardinger, and then people laugh at the last name, but, <laughs> but um, she was a very good, wise woman. And um, the sisters in Germany that she um, founded the community. She uh, sent many of them to the United States because this was the mid 19th century and there were immigrants, German immigrants to the US. And so some of the sisters were sent to the US and she would write letters to buoy up their spirits because it was hard, it, they were poor, they were struggling, they had schools that they were trying to build and maintain. It was not easy, but she uh, gave them courage. And so she wrote many letters to the sisters and one of her, in one of her letters, she has um, a phrase, a, a sentence um, that I have repeated time and time again when I have thought, oh, you know, things are so bad, uh, couldn't be worse, you know, why am I doing this? You know, what is the importance of this? And what is my contribution? Anyway, she said, all the works of God proceed slowly and in pain, but their roots are the sturdier and their flowering the lovelier. And I have that uh, in uh, painted on, in a little picture on my wall in my office. And I think of it often, I've, I think of it, I've uh, repeated it so often as people in the, in the office at New Ways know, I say, all of the works of God proceed slowly and in pain, but their roots are the sturdier and their flowering the lovelier. So she is a person in my life uh, that I have, uh, um, that has helped me to see that uh, it's important that I go on, that it's important uh, to keep doing what we're doing, even in the face of um, times when it, it, it looks so bleak. Um, so she is an important person and she makes me feel loved. The second person I wanna tell you about that uh, makes me feel important and that I'm on the right track is a, a sister, or was, she's now deceased, a sister of Loretto for my second community. I've now been a sister of Loretto for more than 20 years. Oh, don't count my age, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but as someone said, um, uh, we were chatting out here, um, you know, 
my th this is an aside my dad died when he was about 90 and i take after my dad in in like my my father had uh, gallbladder surgery i had gallbladder surgery yeah you know? <laughs> my father never got sick i never get sick my father didn't take medications I don't take medications. So I follow my dad and if, and as each generation usually lives a little longer, so I'll probably live longer than 90. <laughs> anyway, that was an aside. So the, the second person though uh, that has influenced me and that I think about um, when I think, oh, well this, you know, is, is this really worth it? Is this important? Is the sister of Loretto and the sisters of Loretto that I have now been, you know, for 20 years, um, <clears throat> uh, is an, they're an American congregation. So my first community was a, founded in Germany. This congregation was founded in the United States, in Kentucky. When Kentucky was the, the frontier of the U.S., we were founded in 1812, and Kentucky was the farthest point of the U.S. in 1812. But the Sisters of Loretto were pioneers, so they you you would see them. Well, you can see them if you go to our heritage center uh, in the Conestoga wagons going going west, going down the Mississippi, through the Santa Fe Trail, you know, all the way out to California. So they're pioneer women. And um, one of the sisters of Loretto that I <clears throat> did know before she, she passed was Sister Mary Luke Tobin. And some of you probably remember that name from um, Vatican II days and thereafter. And uh, Mary Luke <clears throat> was the president of our community for a number of years. In fact, she was president of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious at the time of the Second Vatican Council. And when she heard about the Second Vatican Council, she, with a companion sister, we always travel with companion sisters, she and a companion sister uh, got on a, a, a boat in those days and uh, went over to Rome. And while she was uh, on the ship, uh, she got a cable from um, was Cardinal Sunans, I think, who sent a cable uh, inviting her. So in other words, she was going whether she was invited or not. <laughs> but she she then attended uh, Vatican II as a representative of the sisters from the US from the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. Well, Mary Luke was absolutely wonderful and gave us all a sense that we are all important. I'll just tell you one little vignette about Mary Luke. She was also protesting like for um, the, you know, a great boycott and uh, for the farm workers and so on. And she was uh, protesting one time, kneeling, I don't know what, I forget what city, but um, a policeman came up to her and she's on the ground. And he says, sister, you know, I'm going to tell your mother superior that you're here. <laughs> And she just looked up at him and she said, honey, I am the mother superior. <laughs> but one um, that's we have many wonderful stories. I can tell you more later. But um, Mary Luke uh, would, has this line that we, we often repeat that has given me uh, great hope and courage and determination. She said, Go out on the limb. That's where the fruit is. You know, so when I was kind of, should I do this? Should I not do that? You know, um, is this important to do or not? Go out on the limb. That's where the fruit is. And I just wanted to share one uh, more person in my life who has been so influential in helping in enabling me to feel that I am important. Um, and that's my dear father. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see, this story is goes back to uh, 1971. Well, so again, don't start counting years, but 1971 was when I met a gay man at the University of Pennsylvania. 
where I was studying. And I, I chose to go to the University of Pennsylvania because it was in Philadelphia, my hometown, and I'd be able to see my parents. And by the way, I'm an only child. I was an only child. <laughs> so um, the person, uh, the main person who got me involved in uh, ministry was a gay man um, named Dominic who had great connections to the press. Now, he didn't know the NCR, unfortunately, but he had connections with the, the uh, major newspapers in Philadelphia. And uh, so he arranged for an interview with me with the Philadelphia uh, evening paper. And here's the headline. None meets with gays in convent. This is 1971. <laughs> Philadelphia, over 50% Catholic. <laughs> So that day, my parents were coming to see me. <laughs> I had not told them about non meeting with gays in the convent, but they read it in the newspaper. <laughs> and so my dad says, uh, what's this? <laughs> uh, how come you're meeting with those people? Uh -huh. And I said, well, well, daddy, somebody has to because the church has neglected them. And so the church has to reach out. Well, let the other nuns do it. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought for a while, remember 1971, um, uh, the Vietnam War era, okay? Uh, a number of my friends were protesting, some even in, you know, arrested and going to her to jail um, and so he says well you're not going to burn any draft records are you <laughs> he said um, because that's against our country you know he was a, a veteran uh, he fought in the second world war is very patriotic that's against our country and I said well no daddy I probably will not you know burn any draft records but what if i did well that is against our country he said but if you did it it would be all right because you're my daughter <laughs> <laughs> and i have reflected on that so much uh since the since 1971 and to me it says that my father was um an example of God's love, that God loves us so much that no matter what we do, even if it's wrong in the eyes of the world or in the eyes of whoever, if it's wrong, that's okay because you're my daughter or you're my son. You are my, my child. So that's the love of our God. And I think that's what sustains me and tells me that I am important. No matter if somebody thinks I'm doing right or wrong, if I am loved by God. And so you are loved by God. We are all loved by God. So this award is really given to um, all of us because we are all newsmakers. We're all uh, newsmakers in whatever area uh, we we have our um, we have some influence okay and we are all prominent we're all important and if you forget you're important know that you that God knows you're important that's what makes you important it's love that makes you important and you are loved by God so I received this award but I receive it in your name. It's, it's This award is for all of you. You have all contributed to the betterment of LGBT people over the years. So I, th I thank you very much. Thank you. And, 
And now this is the best part. This is the Q&A. This is what you really, what, what you really want to hear. Okay. Now, I had some plants here. <laughs> so where are those questions? <laughs> Taking the show on the road, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, um, what? Okay, here we go. <laughs> oh, I don't need that. I'm loud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's one of my clients. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Frank Butler and I'm on the board at the NCR. And I've known Sister Jane since the 1970s uh, when she was just starting out in advocacy and I was at the Bishop's Conference and we had just done the call to action conference. So uh, I've watched your career. I just wondered if you would reflect a little bit on those days compared to these days and what do you think are the most significant changes? I think the most significant changes uh, in our church, and I'll speak in the Catholic community, are the changes that I have seen between, um, we'll say, the hierarchy and the rest of us. Okay. In the days after Vatican II, uh, not all of the hierarchy, but a substantial um, number were very progressive. They had come back from Vatican II, they were all fired up. And if, if you go back and uh, look at some of the statements that were made by bishops and bishops' conferences in, in the U.S., in fact, at Call to Action in 1976, right? Um, uh, Dignity was invited to send a representative. Um, so the on the institutional level, I think there was great openness. We see civil rights statements being made. Um, I have to say this, the National Coalition of American Nuns in 1973 called for civil rights for, well, in those days we only knew, we only said gay and lesbian people, we didn't even know they were transgender people. Um, but on the, on the local level, the parish level, people in the pew, uh, there was hesitancy. And that's one of the reasons I think Father Nugent and I started New Ways Ministry to educate the Catholic community. We, we felt that people need to understand, you know, and when they understand, they'll feel differently, they'll think differently. So, so in the 70s and the early 80s, and maybe into the beginning of the 90s, we see on the hierarchical level of uh, an openness and on the uh, a parish level, the non-hierarchical level, uh, a hesitancy or um, questioning or maybe fear, you know. Um, but then, um, when we get different kinds of bishops in here, uh, you know, late 80s, 90s, and the 2000s, I see a shift, or I saw it, but I still see a shift, so that, um, the laity are much more educated, right? Much more accepting of LGBT people. But the hierarchy, of course, it's a different hierarchy, but they're very, um, I, don't, I mean, anti isn't too strong, <laughs> very anti. So that's the big difference I see, the difference between the upper levels of the church. Oh, yeah, no, it's not upper. <laughs> Um, between the, the clerical level of the church and the non-clerical level of the church. That was the only plant. <laughs> <laughs> this is, is a, probably a question you were kind of looking for. Um, you mentioned your father you know, in your speech. Of course, Janine and I are both of Polish extraction. And when I heard the story about you were pushing the chair of the coaster to the Pope, I thought, well, that sounds like something a Polish person. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wonder, can you speak to how your Polishness has had any impact upon your ministry? 
<laughs> well, I don't know. Um, I will say that when um, Pope John Paul was elected, I was elated because uh, it was uh, it was of my ancestry. I, all my four grandparents were born in Poland. Um, and, you know, that we had these Polish jokes. I don't hear them anymore. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, yeah, dumb. So, um, you know, it really was a point of pride. Um, but then when he started to make some statements, I said, this is not the kind of Polish pope I want, you know. Um, and I have visited Poland uh, several times in the, in the past um, decades. And uh, I'm happy to say there's an LGBT Catholic group there. It's been um, there for a, a number of years, over a decade or more, probably two decades now. And I spoke with them, got a word from them. <laughs> Um, but uh, in one of my trips there, it's not just the Catholic group. Well, Poland is almost all Catholic. But um, there was um, a, another group, the Campaign Against Homophobia, and I uh, went around the to major cities and was on the TV or the radio or you know newspaper, um, met with journalists, and they are quite progressive. So. Um, not everyone in Poland is the same as the mindset of the hierarchy. In other words, what I'm sensing is that Poland now is in a, um, not quite, but a similar situation that I described about the change in the U.S., the hierarchy being very conservative and the, the people um, not, not as liberal as here, uh, but, but uh, certainly not uh, anti, but how has Poland influenced my my ministry? Um, just that I have a soft spot in my heart for Poland. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I'd like to make a comment about this. That a lot of people don't know that the first successful strike in what is now the United States was done by Poles in Jamestown, Virginia. They were glass blowers, and they wanted a representation. And they pulled off a strike because they got the representation in the House of Burgesses. <laughs> Yay for the Poles! <laughs> oh, Yayo, and Yayo helped us to uh, get to know Pope Francis because the very first letter we wrote to Pope Francis, Yayo translated for us. And he, um, you tell them about your, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, you ask your question, then I'll tell. Now, this, this question might be a little mundane, but knowing you and knowing and having followed you for several years already, I would like you to tell us what did you feel when you entered Santa Marta and met Pope Francis? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you probably expect me to say, oh, I was so, you know, overjoyed. I mean, I was happy, but, um, it, you know, it was really like going to see a friend. I mean, I think of Pope Francis as my friend, as you do, and he's your, he was your former teacher. But um, uh, I just felt elated that here's someone I've been writing to, you know, and getting mail from, you know, we're little pen pals and you've never met them. And um, it was just comfortable. I guess that's the nice word. It was so nice. You know, I wasn't flabbergasted, you know, because I knew what he looked like, of course. Um, but I told him I'm going to come to see him next October at the next Senate. And I said, this time I'm going to dance for you because I told him in one of my letters when Whatever it was, he said. I said, "Oh, you made me dance for joy." Well, I'm going to dance for it. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, Pope Francis, when he was uh, a baby priest, I always like to use that baby priest. You know, he was he was a newly ordained. Well, I don't know if he was newly. He was a young Jesuit and taught in high school. And Yaya was one of his students. And when I came back, because Pope Francis had given us some gifts. 
And one of the gifts was um, a, a, a little booklet that had a, a prayer in it, the prayer uh, of uh, Thomas More, Lord Humor. And so I was telling Yayo about it. He said, oh, I know all about it. He taught us that prayer in high school. <laughs> Follow up on that question. Um, I know you moved the chairs. Did you hug you? <laughs> did you hug the Pope? I did. Good. <laughs> Is he a good hugger? Hey, yeah, he's a good hugger. <laughs> Sure. Yes. You know, it's customary, I guess, to give gifts, you know. So we we brought some gifts for him, but he had some gifts waiting for us. And so okay, I want to the first gift did you was um, it's um, a beautiful uh, pearl rosary. And uh, the other people at New Ways that I, Frank, where are you? Frank and Bob, where's Bob? Um, and Matt, who's not here, but uh, they got rosaries too. But their rosary was black and mine was white. So, <laughs> so I don't know if that means he's a little sexist or what. <laughs> And then, now this is something they did not get. <laughs> but it's a, it's a beautiful uh, medal of uh, Our Lady and uh, Child. And uh, Pope Francis has a great devotion to the Blessed Mother. So that was very nice. And then Josh, when he uh, did that podcast, he was, we were looking at, at, the, at these. Oh, there's another one. And then he asked us uh, about the... A prayer of Tom, St. Thomas More on humor. He said, do you know it? And we all shook our heads. No, we don't know. We never heard of it. You know? And so he said, he gave me this book. He said, now here, you read this for them. So I'm going to read it for you because I read it uh, to us that afternoon. Grant me, O Lord, good digestion and also something to digest. <laughs> Grant me a healthy body and the necessary good humor to maintain it. Okay. Grant me a simple soul that knows to treasure all that is good and that doesn't frighten easily at the sight of evil, but rather finds the means to put things back in their place. Give me a soul that knows not boredom, grumbling, sighs, and laments, nor excess of stress because of an obstruction called I. Grant me, O oh Lord, a sense of good humor. Allow me the grace to be able to take a joke and to discover in life a bit of joy and to be able to share that joy with others. And he said, he said, I say that prayer every morning. And so now I say that prayer every morning. <laughs> and uh, when um, Josh was, um, did the podcast, I said, oh, you know, when people give me gifts and my friends know this, I said, oh, don't give me anything. Look how old I am. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of things, you know, not, not get things. Um, so Josh said, well, we'll take them. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I said, those are going to be buried with me. <laughs> that it? Yeah. All right. What do you do? Just shout from there, Frank. You're strangling the people, Frank. All of this for something really minuscule. <laughs> I just wanted to say, Janine was mentioning 
about uh, Pope Francis' devotion to Mary, uh, to the Blessed Mother. And as she's saying that, I'm staring at the picture. And the, the, that picture, if you were a photographer, you could tell it was a, it's a terrible picture because they because it's right into the windows where all the sunlight is coming. It's backlit. And we had originally been on the side when, when we said we would take a photo, and he moved us to the front there because he wanted the background to be that painting, which you can't see, but it is his favorite image of Mary, uh, Antaria of Knots. And you can see the uh, the knots, the, the ribbon being untied. So I just want to point that out. <laughs> and that reminds me, uh, when we got up to leave, um, it was Pope Francis who said, do you want a picture? <laughs> I mean, of course, we had talked about this before, and so we, we wanted a picture, but we had forgotten about a picture. And, um, and then he says, like, where's your phone? And we said, oh, they took our phones at the door. <laughs> <laughs> so he told the, the priest who was there, um, who was a priest from Arlington, by the way, from the Secretary of State. But anyway, <laughs> he was nice. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, uh, so we got our phones, and you know, then we were there. At, under the picture of Our Lady of Tired Knots. And then I, I said to him, can we make this public? And he said, oh, sure. Because, you know, we had been so careful uh, in our correspondence with him not to make things public um, because, uh, you know, we, we weren't really, well, you know, we were black sheep. Oh, sorry, wrong word. <laughs> but we were not... Um, Kosher, and that's not the right word. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but um, we, we did not want to, um, we, yeah, we were on the list. And so we didn't want to ruin his reputation, you know. So um, he said, oh, yes, you can make this public. Maybe these have a little negative here. Uh, would you say something or your thoughts about the fact that the 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 the, the same sex blessing was far from perfect? A lot of, a lot of caveats and restrictions and gifts and you know, uh, the work remains. Uh, what uh, what do we do about? It? Being happy with what happened, but boy, it's uh, far from perfect. Well, we're, we're, it's not yet, you know. We, have, we still have work to do. But what I say is rejoice in what we have. We've come a long way and just uh, gives us energy to keep, keep uh, trying to educate, really. And that's, that's what I think it amounts to, educating people. And removing people's fears, fear, I think is a big, a big thing. Um, but also trying, we should try to appreciate his point of view. Like he is the leader of a, what, how many billion Catholics are there in the world? And he, at heart, uh, I think is with us, except on the women's issue. But, um, <laughs> but he, wants to turn the church around. Now think of a battleship out in the ocean. You don't turn that battleship around in a, like a, even a day, you know, how I'm not a, a mariner, but it takes a long time. So he does not want the bark of Peter to capsize. He, I, I know he's concerned about schism. So, you know, it's only it's only a comment. Um, he he is extraordinary, an extraordinary politician. He knows exactly how to say things that how to say them. And if we look back at that moment in the plane coming back from Rio to Rome, when when he said, "Who am I to judge?" 
And really, at, at that time, it was an explosion. Everybody thought, my God, what is he saying? And but when we look back and we see that from that first, those three first uh, 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 words, or four words, to what he's done now, it is so extraordinary. But he does it like that. There are small steps that he knows. As you said, there are a lot of fear. And what, you, what he has to do is to take those fears away from Hello, um, I'm Sister Cecilia, I'm a daughter of charity, and something has been missing, and I just want to say it. Sister, you have given religious women a voice in talking to leadership, in talking about their most private fears, inclinations, who they are. And I can't speak for the priest, but I can say for sisters, you have been a gift. And um, you have helped sisters do that. And I don't want that to be missed. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, remark because that reminds me, you know, we hear so much about, well, we don't hear so much, but we hear about gay priests and we don't hear about lesbian sisters and we do have lesbian sisters in our congregations and i'm very happy to say that uh, our leadership has been very very supportive and uh, many congregations are uh, having um, education days about sexuality so that not only the leadership but uh, everyone in the in the community will uh, understand and accept and love. And that's the bottom line, isn't it? It's the love. Mm. Pardon? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We have, we have one more thing to give you, but I just wanted to mention the photo that Frank was talking about. I think the Pope's expression is great. It's like the Italian Argentine is coming out and he's looking at people going, you got a problem with this? <laughs> you, got, you got a problem? You come talk to me about it. I love that. Like, I dare you. Go ahead. Um, uh, in addition to uh, this, we also wanted to give you a little something else for yourself. And Josh, if you can read it, this is from your own writing. Our colleague, Lori Krupp, had this made. It's a representation of a quote from you, Judy. When the human community has grown in its understanding of right and wrong, when people honestly acknowledge that good should always be done and evil avoided, when the human family lives as loving brothers and sisters, then Christ will arrive once again to proclaim the everlasting reign of God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. there's a cardinal at the bottom, I think it's kind of appropriate for your status as well. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I just, uh, let me just end by thanking so much the Paulists Father Steve, especially for hosting us. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful new facility. It's only been open since November of 22. And the Paulists have been welcoming us, and they've been great hosts. So if you want to do something here that you couldn't do at JP2, uh, Father Steve could help you with that. Thank you all. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>